I believe God is doing a very specific work. I want you just to look at your neighbor really quick and announce to them, I, I'm going into my message, but I'm not really going into my message. <laughs> um, but I feel the Lord doing something here. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, be the one. Look at your other neighbor and say, be the one. Look at the neighbor that you didn't choose and announce to them the subject matter of our conversation and say, be the one. Now, just turn around and grab your Bibles really quick, really quick. Just, I feel the need to, to change up where we're going for a minute. We'll ultimately get back to the narrative. But in Luke chapter 11, no, Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19 will be the narrative of Scripture that we will explore today. And I believe God will use this narrative of Scripture to enlighten our hearts. But... Look at your neighbor. Uh, you're going to just get acquainted with your neighbor. Look at your neighbor and say, rise up. It's this short series that we're in that I actually borrowed from my wife, who is this fall in the annual women's conference, the ROAR conference. She is using that as the theme so I'm preempting her, but really just kind of getting your spirit ready for what's going to happen then. But, but I don't want to begin in the narrative just yet because I want to take you to another place. You don't even have to turn there, but in James chapter 5, verse 15, it's a verse that's really loosely connected at best to the narrative in Luke chapter 17 but it is the theme that i believe god is trying to utilize today to energize our faith that particular verse says and i was going to go to this later but i i feel the need to go ahead and go to it because i believe this is what god is doing in luke chapter 5 verse 15 it says that the prayer of faith or the prayer offered up in faith will make the sick person well. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Everybody say faith. The prayer offered up in faith will make the sick person well. And then it says, and the Lord will raise them up. Mm. Hold on a second. The prayer offered up in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise them up. Here is James, the half-brother of Jesus, who is highlighting for us the fact that Jesus, that the Messiah is a not just a saving Messiah, but he's also a healing Messiah. He is outlining for us the fact that he was witness to the healing ministry of Jesus, and he says to us that the Lord will raise them up. That particular word in the Greek for raise, that word obviously has some, some meanings that, that, that are somewhat obvious. It means to be lifted up or, or to stand up, but, but it means to be aroused from sleep into life. It means to bring something back that was dead and now it is alive. Here is James drawing our attention to the fact that this word raised in the Greek draws and paints for us the image of who the Messiah is, that he is the Lord. Lord that heals. He is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals me. It makes me think of so many different Psalms. It makes me think of Psalms 103 that says, forget not the benefits of God, for he heals all of our diseases. It makes me think of Psalms chapter 102 that says, the Lord heard my cry and he sent his word and he healed me. He sent his word and he set me free. Why? Because the Savior, the Lord God Almighty, he will heal your broken heart, the Bible says. The Bible says, says come unto him if you need rest if you are burdened because he will set you free he will give to you rest the bible is very specific that he is a healing god you need to understand today that god is a healing god somebody slap your neighbor and say he'll heal you mm. says he'll raise you up 
The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the same spirit that dwells in you, that quickens your mortal body. Hold on a second, but here is James using this word in the Greek for raised that also has a secondary meaning. It doesn't just mean to be healed in your body. Here's what's beautiful. That word also means to be healed in so many other ways, to be moved from obscurity to clarity, to be moved from inactivity to victory, to be moved from ruins into restoration. Is somebody going to praise a God who cries out from his word, who says, I will heal you. Somebody ought to praise him because he will heal. I feel the Lord today is going to do a healing work in this place. Somebody needs to be healed in your body. Somebody needs to be healed in your spirit. Somebody needs to be healed in your mind. Somebody needs to be healed in your marriage. Somebody needs to be healed in your finances and your faith has been diminished because of the scenery in your life. But what you need to understand is the word that God is giving you today is about to shift some things in your life because he's going to take off of you pain. He's going to take off of you sorrow. He's going to take off of you suffering. He's going to take off of you sadness. He's going to take off of you problems. And he's going to enable you to be raised up to walk into life. To be raised up in blessing. To be raised up in favor. Somebody give him a preemptive celebratory praise. Because it's our ability to praise him that brings in blessing in our lives. Come on and praise him church. Mm. who's got a need in your life? You've got a need in your life. You just have a need. Wow. Here's a thought. This is where I wanted to begin. But here's the thought. It is our willingness to celebrate the goodness of God that opens up our hearts to receive his faithfulness. Did you hear that? It is our willingness to celebrate the goodness of God that opens up our hearts to receive his faithfulness. His faithfulness. Mm. Let me j just be seated. Carmen, keep playing. Let me, let me use James chapter 5 as a reference point <laughs> for the narrative. And let me paint for you an image that I believe Luke has more adequately painted for us. Let me read to you part of the narrative. It says in verse 11, if you're there, say, I'm there. Now on his way to Jerusalem... Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance. And he called, and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Verse 14 says, when he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Hang on a second, don't read any further. Because there's a few things in this verse that I believe are worth noting. Number one, Luke is painting for us an image. He's trying to take the reader and place the reader into the story. He's, he's making us aware of the complexities of our faith. While at the same time showing us the power of our faith if we overcome some of those complexities. You see, this passage of Scripture, these few verses are broken up really into two parts, and both of them have the common theme of faith. In this part of this passage, Luke is painting for us everything that is happening within the realm, the season, the year, the culture of or of what is taking place, at least in Luke chapter 17. In other words, he's giving us the historical, the cultural, 
the geographical area as to which this miracle takes place. The Bible says that he is walking, if you will, on the border between Samaria and Galilee. He's walking on the border. Some of your translations say that he's walking in the middle between Samaria and Galilee, between the Samaritans and the Jewish culture. The Samaritans and the Jews do not get along. They never mingle. However, here is Jesus walking down the middle, if you will. And the one thing that is causing the Samaritans and the Jewish people to mingle in this story is their common tragedy, their common bond of brokenness. You see, it is unusual for Samaritans and Jews to hang out, but it is not unusual for lepers of different cultures to hang out. Why? Because the Bible and history tells us that it was forbidden by law, if you had leprosy, to be near someone who was healthy. That's why the Bible says that they stopped from a distance and cried out, Jesus! The brokenness of their humanity... What's their common bond? They let go of their national prejudices and other prejudices because of the common bond of brokenness that they had. The tragedy in their lives enabled them to scream and to shout to the Messiah in unison, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. But it's what takes place in verse 14. Put it back up for me. It's what takes place in verse 14 that draws our mind to the power of faith. Because in verse 14, he says, when he saw them, he said, go, everybody say go. Go and show yourselves to the priests, which is something you didn't do. The unclean didn't go to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Hold on a second. It says, as they went, they were cleansed. Mm, this is good. You're not catching this. You see, every miracle has a seed of instruction. It is our willingness to act upon that seed that proves our faith. Notice it did not say Jesus touched them and they were healed. It said Jesus sent them, go to the priest, and as they went, they were cleansed. This is powerful. It was their faith in action. It was their willingness to step out in faith that brought about the dynamic of healing in their lives. It was the old man putting on the new man, even though the old man still felt like the old man. <laughs> It was the old man putting on the new man, even though he still felt and looked like the old man. The point that I'm trying to make is the only condition in this miracle was their obedience. To follow the instruction and leave the pity party. Mm, hold on a second. Because I need you to get this. For some of you, your miracle stays in seed form because you're not willing to follow the instructions and rather you stop at the pity party. Let that get in your spirit. You're not willing to follow the instructions and so rather you stop at the pity party. How many of you have had a pity party before? Come on. How many of you have never had one? And if you've never had one, you just polish your halo and you think about something else and join us a little later. God, I don't understand this. God, when's all this mess going to stop? God, I'm tired of this. You know how it is. God, I'm just so worn out with this. I'm so tired of these kids. I'm so tired of this problem. I'm so tired of this job. God, I'm just, I, I don't, it just seems like everything I touch, it just messes up. I'm just a loser, God. I, try, I don't have any clothes to wear, God. Everything I put on just makes my belly look fat. I don't like this, God. I don't like God. I'm tired of looking at my checking account. It doesn't have any money. And he says, go and establish a godly budget, and then you'll have more to manage. But God, have pity on me, Jesus. My husband would just, I don't know. I just don't, I don't know. I don't feel like he loves me. Jesus, Jesus. Well, if you'll exhibit love, and you'll go and exhibit love, you'll feel the love that you're so desiring. But Jesus, 
grab this for a moment. Because here these ten people are. They can't hang around with anyone else but other broken people. So obviously there is extreme baggage in their lives. And it says they stop at a distance and they cry out, Jesus, have pity on us. And they were not cleansed until they walked the road that God had commanded. In other words, here's what the Holy Spirit is dropping in my lap. It's the commanded road when we walk it that we receive the blessing. But it's what takes place after verse 14, Jason, that becomes the centerpiece of this narrative. Verses 15 and following. This is where I really want to spend our time. Watch this. Verse 15 says this. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, he came back. Everybody say he came back. He came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and he thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Stop right there. Where are the other ten? Where are the other ten? Or where are the other nine? Were there not ten who were healed? Were there not ten who were set free? Where are the other nine? Did the other nine find something more important to do than to come back and celebrate the Savior? Where are the other nine? Did the other nine go back to an old life? Where are the other nine? Were the other nine too busy now in their schedule to come back and praise a Savior who just healed them? You see, sometimes we're looking to be healed, but not necessarily looking for the Savior. And God is looking for those who will leave that place in order to get on their face before a Savior who can do more than just heal them but set them free and I believe so often I need you to grab this because I believe so often it is the pity in our lives that accompanies us into the victory that God has planned for us that ultimately causes that victory to seem anticlimactic and the reason why it seems anticlimactic is because our pity is greater than our praise Were there not ten? He says, were there not ten? Where are the other nine? Only one came back to praise a Savior. Only one. Only one was willing to let go and to go into what I have for them. Only one was willing to come and lift his hands and praise me. Only one was willing to walk from what was to what is. Only one was willing to walk out of ruins into restoration. Only one was willing to let go of what was so that he could walk into what God is about to do. Only one was to say, I'm going to believe in you because I'm letting go of my pity to grab hold of some praise. Let go of all of that so that I can walk into all that you have. Only one only one somebody help me be the one somebody be the one be the one look at your neighbor and say be the one be the one who walks out of brokenness into wholeness be the one who celebrates a savior who desires to heal you be the one somebody shout be the one but so often no I need you to grab this so often our breakthrough is delayed because the place of pity overcomes the place of praise. Because the place of pity becomes safer for us than the place of praise. Because we're not willing to leave that place in order to fall on our face to seek his. There's so much happening in this narrative. I mean, just so much. But two things, Paul, that I really see happening that are worthy of highlighting is celebration and sacrifice. I mean, think about it. There's celebration and sacrifice. Only one was willing to drop whatever he was doing in order to come back and praise the Savior who just healed him. There, there's, 
obvious, this, this theme of praise here, and, and Luke is connecting our praise to the miraculous, but praise can really be broken down into two features according to this passage of Scripture. Were there not ten, only one of you came back, only one of you, came, only one of you sacrificed some time to come back. So there's sacrifice and celebration when it comes to the heart of praise. The Bible says that offer up our lives as a living sacrifice of praise. That's what this narrative is about. Offering up his life, stopping what he was doing long enough to come and fall at the feet of, of Jesus. There's, there's both sacrifice and celebration. And one cannot be sustained without the other. I need you to grab this. Sacrifice and celebration are codependent. One cannot be sustained without the other. You cannot have all sacrifice and no celebration, and you cannot have all celebration without sacrifice because it is the sacrifice that ultimately makes the celebration that much more beautiful. Am I making sense? Listen, you can't have the breakthrough without your willingness to sacrifice and to act. You can't receive the award, if you will, without your willingness to act. You can't move from the place of pity into a party without it being bridged with your desire to celebrate and to praise. I don't know who this is for, but you can't have everything like you may be 20 years old. You can't have everything that your parents have if you're not willing to sacrifice the way they sacrificed. You can't have restoration in your marriage if you are not willing to sacrifice and forgive. You see, you must have sacrifice and celebration. Celebration and sacrifice. They're both connected, but somebody needs to hear this. You do not have to have the victory in order to praise God because sometimes your willingness to celebrate who God is ultimately brings you into the victory. Were there not ten? He said, were there not ten? He's looking around. Were there not ten? Where are the other nine? Where are the other nine? Were there not ten? Where are the ones who would drop the chaos in their lives long enough to come and praise me, he's saying. He's looking for those who will stop what they're doing long enough to cry out to him regardless of what is happening in their lives. He's looking for those who will push through the chaos in order to bow down at his feet. He's looking for those who will take on the posture of praise and celebration in their hearts regardless of what is happening. Because it is the posture of praise in your heart, the posture of your heart that ultimately enables God to give you the position that he has for you. Good Lord have mercy. Were there not ten Some of you right now, you're saying, well, to be perfectly honest with you, I, I don't really have anything in my life worth celebrating. Because the dynamic of whatever's going on in your life, I, I don't have anything worth celebrating. Oh, yes, you do. You're breathing, aren't you? I don't have anything worth celebrating. Oh, yes, you do. You got clothes on your back, don't you? The sun came up this morning, didn't it? And the Bible says that his mercies are new every single morning. Oh, Lord, have mercy. You see, some of you need to understand this. The Bible says do not des despise small beginnings because the Lord rejoices when the work begins. Some of you need to begin to celebrate the little things and the big things. You need to begin to celebrate the little blessings and the big blessings because sometimes it's easy to praise God when everything is going right. But God is looking for those who are willing to celebrate him even though they're still awaiting his provision. Good Lord, have mercy. I don't know who this is for. How many of you in here, you said you have a need? You need something rebuilt? You need something restored? You need breakthrough in a certain area of your life? Lift up your hands. Then here's what I want you to do. I want you to praise God with a preemptive celebratory praise. That act, I want you to act like your breakthrough's already come. I want you to act like you've already received from God everything that you have been asking for. I want you to act like you're walking into that breakthrough. I want you to act like you're walking into that promise. I want you to act like, listen, my problems are not going to overcome me because I'm going to run into what he's got for me. Good Lord, have mercy. In fact, let me, let me read something to you. I, I've changed this up. So the worship team, you, you just, y'all go ahead and make your way this way. 
Sorry, I told you where you were going to come up earlier, but I just changed some things up. Let me read something to you. This was written by Matthew Henry. Matthew Henry may not even sound familiar to you, but he is one of the greatest biblical commentators, if you will, that there's ever been. And he says this, he says, we can always find a reason for gratitude before God. Matthew Henry, the famous Bible commentator, was robbed of his wallet once. Mugged. And he wrote in his diary that night all the things that he was thankful about. First, that he had never been robbed before. Second, that though they took his wallet, they did not take his life. Third, because even though they took it all, it wasn't very much. <laughs> and finally, because he was the one who was robbed and not the one who did the robbing. You see, could it be, could it be that it is our willingness to celebrate, to find something to be grateful for? that opens up or that is the starting point for the next chapter in our life. Because in verses 16 through 18, I need you to grab this because it's verse 19 where it all comes together. In verses 16 through 18, put it up there again, verses 16 through 18. It says, he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him and he was a Samaritan. What Luke is telling you is that he was like, the one that everyone thought wouldn't come and celebrate, and he did. It says, Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? And where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Huh. Isn't it amazing that the thing that was meant to destroy him is the very thing that brought him before the one who could deliver him? But it's verse 19. It's verse 19. It says, Then Jesus said to him, Rise. Everybody say rise. rise. Hold on a second. If we go back and we think about James chapter 5, verse 15, James said, And the prayer that is offered up in faith will make the sick person well. But then he says, And the Lord will raise them up. Are you seeing this? And the Lord will raise them up. Here is this dude. He came back and he fell at the feet of Jesus. He's celebrating Jesus for the physical healing that he had. And Jesus says, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. It's probably not all coming together, but hang on. He says, rise and go. Everybody say rise. He says, rise and go. Your faith has made you well, the word used here in the Greek is a little different than the word raise that James used in James chapter 5. However, when you first look at it, the word rise actually means to stand up, but it has a secondary meaning. Many theologians believe Jesus was making reference to the secondary meaning. The secondary meaning means to be raised to life, to come back to life. Something that was dead is now coming to life. And he says, rise and go. <laughs> Your faith has made you well. Well, hold on a second. Earlier in verse 14, the dude was healed. Now it seems as if Jesus is making reference to a second healing. And it's this healing that Jesus is calling our attention to. He says, arise and go. Your faith has made you well. There was a physical healing, and now there is a healing in his heart. Remember all of the baggage, all of the pity, all of the stuff. They've been outcast forever. And now he's saying, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. There is something that is greater about this healing than the previous healing. So hang on a second. If he was healed in verse 14 and he's healed again in verse 19, what happened in the middle? Are you getting this? What happened in the middle? 
What happened in the middle was he put his praise on. What happened in the middle is he had a preemptive celebratory praise that ultimately brought him the healing that he needed. What happened in the middle was his ability to rise up because he had already praised God. What happened in the middle was that he stepped in, laid down before the Lord, and the Lord was so appreciative of that celebratory praise that he gave him a greater healing and he said, rise up. You see, what I'm trying to say to you is that the prayer offered up in faith will make the sick person well and the Lord will raise them up. Rise up. Your praise will enable you to rise. Your praise will enable you to go around what is coming against you. Your ability to, to, to get through is based upon your willingness to praise. Somebody come on and help me in this place. Rise up. Rise up. I said rise up. Rise up. Rise up. Good Lord have mercy. Hold on, I want to do something different. I want to do something different. I feel the Lord right here. How many of you, again, there's a place in your life that you need healing in? Remember, James said, the prayer offered in faith <laughs> will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise them up. That word raised does not just mean that he's going to heal your physical need. It means that he'll heal you in every way. So hang on a second. If you've got a need, a place that needs to be healed in your life, I, I just want you to raise your hand high. I'm going to ask you to do something that may be uncomfortable. But I believe it's warranted. Jesus said, then go, and as they walk the commanded road, they receive the blessing. So I'm going to ask you to step out from where you are and to line this altar. I'm going to ask you to step out from where you are and to come and receive what God has for you. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't allow something that's or someone or to keep you from receiving what God wants to do in your life this morning because there is a healing work that he desires to do. These people are coming from all over. I, I, need, I need prayer partners. I need life coaches. I, I, I need e-group leaders. I, you know who you are. Just, just touch each and every person if you can. Don't leave anyone up here by themselves. Just, just pray for someone for a second. Move to someone else. Obviously, there's so many. But, but I believe God is about to do the miraculous right here, right now. And I believe all we need to do is break into some preemptive celebratory praise. So come on, everybody else. I want you just to worship the Lord. Let's see what he's going to do. Come on.